with your friends and somebody says, yeah, we should go skydiving tomorrow. <laughs> and you go, yeah, we'll go skydiving tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, and you go, yeah, and everybody goes, yeah. So then that night you're laying in your bed and you just keep, <laughs> <laughs> and you're terrified. You keep imagining over and over again, jumping out of an airplane and you can't figure out why you would do that. And you're laying there and you have the worst night's sleep of your life. You wake up the next day and you go, you know, down and you say where you were going to meet and everybody's there. So you get in the van and you don't know that your friends had the same night that you had because they're pretending like they didn't. They're like, yeah, man, my uncle's a Navy SEAL. And, you know, this is going to be great. I've been looking forward to this. And you're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And your stomach is terrible. You can't eat and everything. But you don't want to be the only punk who doesn't jump out of this airplane. So you get there. And then you have this safety brief and you're standing there and the guys will tell you, well, if the chute doesn't open, what's going to happen is you're doing you. Well, well, why the hell, why, what could happen? <laughs> so you fly and you go up, you go up, you go up, you go up to 14,000 feet and you notice there's a, a, a light. It's red and it's yellow and green, right? So right now the light's red. So then you start thinking at some point the light's going to go green because you don't know what's going to happen, right? And you wait and it goes yellow and the light goes green and somebody opens the door and in that moment you realize you've never been in a freaking airplane with the door open and you go and the guy walks you up to the end of the thing and you're standing and your toes are on the edge and you're looking out down to death and they say on three and they say one two and he pushes you on two because people grab on three and you go and you fall out of the airplane and in one second you realize that it's the most blissful experience of your life you're flying right it doesn't feel like falling right it's like the, you actually are kind of held a little bit by the wind and then you start and you you start falling you falling and you there's zero fear. You realize that the point of maximum danger is the point of minimum fear. It's bliss. It's bliss. And you're flying. <laughs> right? And you're doing that. And then 20 seconds, 25 seconds, 40 seconds. And you have enough time to just kind of be like, oh, that's that building. That's not like that one. <laughs> oh, you can see the ocean. And the, the lesson for me was, why were you scared in your bed the night before? Why did you, what do you need that fear for? Why are you scared in your bed 16 hours before you jump? Why are you scared in the car? Why could you not enjoy breakfast? What, 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 what did you need that? The fear is, fear of what? You're nowhere even near the airplane. Everything up to the stepping out there's actually no reason to be scared. It only just ruins your day. You're, you don't have to jump. And then in that moment, all of a sudden where you should be terrified is the most blissful experience of your life. And God placed the best things in life on the other side of terror. On the other side of your maximum fear are all of the best things in life. I show that video because um, today um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, fear. And the reason why we have to talk about fear is because today we're going to talk about reality. And so I want us to kind of uh, get our heads kind of in that, in that mode of thinking about those type of things. Um, but before we jump into that stuff, um, I want to share what we talked about last week. We started this brand new series called Pivot. And the idea last week is to understand what a pivot is. Um, it's not just a basketball term, um, although it's used in basketball quite often. Um, it is this idea that you are planted in one spot. Like there is one place, there's a central point, there is a foundation. And as you are planted, you can oscillate, which means sway back and forth, um, forward, backwards, right, left, up, there. you sway back and forth, but you can never lose um, basically that center point or that foundation. And so last week we said this, we asked the question, right? What is your foundation? Now, we talked a little bit about saying your foundation needs to be in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 
I mean, now we all know that, but then I ask the real question, is it? Because if your life does not look like what we talked about in Galatians, which is living by the Spirit, through the Spirit, with the Spirit, then the question becomes, where is your true foundation? Remember, the, uh, the church in Galatia at the time was sitting back and they were, they, were, um, they were pulled in different directions. They were told by Paul to live by the Spirit and that the Spirit and through grace you are saved, right? Through Jesus Christ, through grace, through the cross, through the blood, through the Spirit, you are saved. Amen? Amen? But then there was a bunch of other people that were coming in that seemed just, they kind of were like Paul, but they were preaching works. They were preaching the law. They're saying, if you, if you do the law uh, on top, yeah, we love Jesus, we love that, yes, we get him, yes, uh, but you still have to do the works. And you're only going to get into heaven if you do the works. And I said that some of us, we still live in the law. And that's where our anchor is. And that's why you feel all the time depressed or feel like you aren't good enough to be in God's, in God's uh, or face to face with God because you're so busy trying to fulfill the law that God himself already did with the cross. Amen? Amen. That's exactly what uh, Paul was trying to preach. And then I gave you homework and you guys went, oh. That's why half of you guys probably aren't here today. Ah, oh, you gave us homework. And I didn't do my homework. I'm not grading your homework. It's just something to spur, like spur you on to, to, to go deeper in the scripture. I asked you guys, read Galatians. It was only six chapters long. If you read a chapter a day, um, you could basically uh, finish the whole, or the whole book before you came back today. And now some of you guys, I hope you guys took that challenge. But here was the second part of that challenge is, if you read something you didn't understand, just write it down. And I told you, I, I, I would love to hang out with you after service and answer as many of those questions that you have that I possibly can. And if I can't answer them, somebody around you sitting here might be able to. And so that was kind of what we talked about last week in this whole idea of ba basically the pivot. We need to learn or understand what our foundation is, where is our anchor, right? And then as we start to pivot, we're not going to change, but we pivot. That makes us fluid in life. When things come our way, you know, we're more like a trampoline than a brick wall, right? You guys understand that saying? Because a trampoline has many, many springs in it, doesn't it? But if I pull out four or five springs, the trampoline still works. I know this for a fact, okay? Because it's the truth, it does. You knock four or five bricks out of a wall, that wall is no longer sturdy. And so many times we build our faith like a brick wall and all of a sudden when life hits us, we lose a few bricks and our wall, our faith starts to get shaky. We need to be like a trampoline. Plus walls are meant to keep you out. Trampolines are meant to invite people in and have fun, right? Yes. It's, it's boring jumping by yourself. All right, so, so this is the concept. Learn to pivot. And so today, the next thing that we need to learn in this, in this art of pivoting, if you will, is we need to learn what is reality. Now, this is like crazy because this hurt my brain this week. If you start thinking about what is reality, because what, what may be real to you is not actually real to me. And the first thing I could think of was this. Let's see, yeah, boom. <laughs> See, some of you that, that are, are internet savvy are, are, okay? So here's the thing. This is a dress, okay? Yes. Problem is, I don't know what color this dress is. So, here's what's going on. How many of you in this room right now see this dress as white and gold? White and gold. Now, some of you, when I said that, you're like, what are you talking about? I see blue and black. Anybody see blue and black in here? Yeah. That dress is blue and black, right? But the other is white and gold again? This is our, wait, wait, white and gold, white and gold people. Hold on, hold on. That's our reality. Blue and black people, raise your hand. That is your reality. We are staring at the exact same dress. <laughs> it has nothing to do with color blindness. I, I find this to be super fascinating because here's how it works. I want to show you, some of you guys are like freaking out right now. Like what? So just so you guys all know, gold 
and white people. <laughs> white and gold people. Gosh. I forgot. I'm sorry. Jeez, no emails, please. Let's talk about white people up in here. Who's the gold people at? No, I just. Okay. You all know what I meant. Listen. White and gold people. <laughs> you are wrong. What? Really? That dress is blue and black. It is absolutely blue and black. Now, here's the thing. I'm in your boat because when I look at it, I see white and gold as well. This is what it's called. It's called color constancy. Color constancy means this. Your brain is looking at this and it's filling in the gaps that we cannot see. See, if you're looking at this dress and you see it as gold and white, you are looking at it through the lens of natural light. Those of you that see the actual blue and black dress, your brain is connecting it and saying you're seeing it through artificial light so you see the real colors. I know that sounds weird, but this is why it hurts your brain when you think about reality. <laughs> because your reality might not be what is actual truth. Now, when somebody comes up to you, and they tell you that seeing is believing, you now have a picture to show them and say, lies. <laughs> True? So then I start asking the question, not if this is how this happens with, with just one image, then the question starts to become, what other places in our reality has our brain tried to fill in the gaps and we've created a false reality? Because one of the things that I start to look at is how many people do that with the scriptures. Yeah. Not only do it with scriptures, I'll put something else in it. We also do it in politics. We do it in so many different areas of our life. We just fill in the gaps and we just say, this is what it is. This is my reality. The problem is, here's the huge problem. There's only one reality. There's only one. And you have to be vulnerable enough to sit back and say that you're wrong. I was figuring I was going to get quiet at that point. <laughs> but you have to be willing to sit back and say, I might not be seeing this the way I need to see it. Do you know this is why in scripture, or not even, not even in scripture, but this is why God created community? Why? Because we need to be able to lean and trust each other. If I was the enemy and I know that it's how God created um, the world is to lean on one another so that way we can understand what reality is, you know the one thing I'm going to destroy first? Community. I'm going to pull you. I'm going to segregate you out. I'm going to put you on the side. And so therefore, you're by yourself. And when you're by yourself, I can make you believe whatever reality I want you to believe. And so many people in life, you might know them. You might have friends that are like that, that have, that have literally isolated themselves. And they said, look, I don't want to do this. And the reason why they don't want to be in community is they say, nobody understands me. They don't get my problems. They don't understand me. And what is happening is the enemy is snuck in and has isolated somebody and they're starting to believe their own reality. That's why you start to believe the lies of the enemy when he tells you you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, that you'll never be uh, able, uh, that, that, that God's grace can't cover you. When he says all these different things and he lies to you, you start to believe it because you don't have a community around you to give you the truth of what reality truly is. Amen? Yes. So our job, if we're going to be able to pivot well, we need to learn to be in community with one another. And then sit back and to really just kind of say, where am I going wrong? And then be vulnerable enough, vulnerable enough to say yay or nay to it. If we are going to be vulnerable in a community, just so you guys know, you're going to need courage. 
Vulnerable, it does not mean, and I want to I walk this through with you. Vulnerable does not mean to be transparent. Because once again, like the dress, I can show you whatever I need to show you and say I'm being transparent. Vulnerability is scary because basically what you're opening yourself up to is physical and emotional hurt. That's what you're opening yourself up to if you're going to be vulnerable. Why? Because if somebody coming up to you and saying that you're wrong, nobody in this place likes to be wrong. It's a human, it's a human nature thing. You're wrong. Nuh-uh. You shove it. Right? Like this is it. We don't like to be wrong. Nobody does. Being vulnerable opens yourself up for physical and emotional hurt. And I want us to understand that when we start to be vulnerable with one another, this, is, this might take place. That's why we guard ourselves. We say we're transparent, but not vulnerable. Everybody's still walking with me in this. I know we're going deep in the pivot series. I know. I, we're, we're really challenging ourselves. Because if we are going to be the holy and righteous people that God has asked us to be, then we need to get to the root of all of these things. Amen? Amen. I want to tell you guys um, about a man and a woman um, that grew up, uh, didn't grow up, but they lived in uh, the 1940s. Just after, uh, like, the, uh, like, this actually took place in 1944. Their names, um, I want to get the story completely right for you guys. It's Richard and Sabina um, Wormbrand. Anybody ever heard of them? Yeah, a few of you guys have. Okay, let me tell you what's going on. Backdrop, okay? Communism is like ruling, okay? Russia's invading all these different places. Uh, Romania is, in, is in, their, in, in their grips. And there's a man named Joseph Stalin. If you guys don't know who Joseph Stalin is, he is a very, very bad man. And I encourage you guys to look up your history so that we don't repeat history and let this type of thing happen again. Everybody with me? Joseph Stalin, he's, impl he's implementing communism um, uh, in, in all of his, uh, in, in all the things that he's over. Uh, that his, basically, his regime is going in and doing this. Well, in Romania in 1944, they got together a, a parliamentary um, thing. Now, and to us, it's basically they got everybody together, um, um, all the uh, political figures, and they got together 4,000 pastors, priests, um, and bishops. Got them all into the room. And they basically said, we are now communists. What you need to do is you need to confess, this is a big word, you need to confess that you believe in Joseph Stalin and his regime, and you need to basically um, say that you're with us. 4,000 pastors, priests, bishops, who know and love Jesus Christ, who have literally said that, I mean, preached the gospel over and over and over again are now sitting in a room and somebody's telling them that if they want to have a place in the world, if they want to have a home to go back to, if they don't want to be terrorized, then they need to confess in Joseph Stalin and communism. Richard is sitting there. Sabina is sitting there. And they are mortified. Because one after one, pastors started getting up and confessing that they believe in communism and in Stalin and his regime. One after another. And they have to go through. Like this is a parliament thing. So it's like almost taking a vote. They're literally going through. So and so, where do you stand? So and so, where do you stand? And, and Sabina, and I, this, the, I, this has got, she's from Romania, so she's got to be a hard woman. But this is, this is like... She's sitting there and she grabs her husband. This is how the story goes. She turns to Richard. She grabs her husband and she looks him dead in the eyes and says, when will you go up there and wipe the spit off of Jesus' face? And Richard turns back like a normal husband would and be like, honey, I love you. Which is actually what he said. Honey, I love you. But if I go up there, you will no longer have a husband and the life that we had is gone. And she looked him dead in the eyes and she said, good, because I never wanted to marry a coward. Oh. 
<laughs> you think he was vulnerable? Opened himself up for a little bit of hurt? But see, that's how you know you married the right person. Because you could say that and the other one's not offended by it. Does that make sense? You listen to it. You take it in. And he says, you're right. And he stands up and he walks towards the podium. And he stands behind the podium. And he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, how dare you? Our communism and Christ are not equal. Christ alone is the Lord. Stalin is under Christ. If anything, he will never be equal or above Christ. Therefore, I stand on Christ alone. Amen. About a month later, Richard was kidnapped, put into prison, and beaten and tortured. Bless you. For 14 years. They went and told his wife, Sabina, that they killed her husband. And they were allowed to do that in the state that they were in because of, the commun because of communism. And so she went on being a widow in prison. I don't know if you guys can see. These are pictures of them. Are they even going up? Yeah, that's them. When uh, that, uh, was going. This next picture is him um, uh, just taken in. Okay. And here's, the, here's what happens. 14 years he was beaten. 14 years he was tortured. During those 14 years, a few guards came to know Jesus Christ. And he was known for smiling all the time. All the time. 14 years, obviously, when communism was defeated and, and, and Joseph Stalin was taken out of power and all this kind of stuff went down. I won't get into all the, the details of it. But he was released from prison. He got to go to the UN. And when he went to the UN, he showed him all of his scars all over his whole body and declared that Jesus Christ is still Lord and King, even in the prisons. He then went on, found his wife again. Um, they reconnected and lived uh, at a very old age. Still, she was one of those women that was, uh, but um, uh, she re they basically never had to remarry because they were still married the whole time. She just thought he was passed away, okay? But here's the thing. He wrote a book called Tortured for Christ, and they started an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. If you have never heard Voice of the Martyrs, I encourage you to check it out. Because what they are doing, they are giving a voice to the voiceless. And they became the voice for the persecuted church around the world. But what did it take? It took a pivot. See, he had a plan. He had, he had, he had a way to go. He had this thought process of how life was going to pan out for him and his wife. And all of a sudden, the world took place. Life came at him, and he had to sit back, and he had to say, what am I going to do? See, the other uh, pastors inside that room at that moment, when they were confessing uh, to Stalin and to his regime, when they were denying Christ and stepping up, their foundation was not solid. They did not have an anchor in Christ. Their anchors were pulled up, and when, when life hit them, they floated somewhere else. And they just went, and they were tossed like a wave on the sea. But not Richard. Him and his wife took a stand. Their anchor was in Christ, no matter what, even unto death. And when I think about this, this is courage. Not because he was afraid. Let's just be real. Fear is a big thing in our lives. And I got to this place because I was asking God, if I'm going to give this message and we're going to talk about uh, vulnerability and we're going to talk about this courage, you know what I mean? God, what is, what is courage? And, and I got to this place where courage is not the lack of fear. Courage is the physical expression of a conviction that you have. Think about it. 
It's not the lack of fear. We're going to fear many things. But when you are convicted by something, there is nothing that is going to stop you. When you are convicted about uh, who you are, nothing stops you. And that's what I see that, that courage is. You are convicted about something and you chase after it no matter what. Are you guys still walking with me in this? Because you're very quiet and that, that scares me a little bit. So I'm asking you today, what are you convicted of? And my last thing, I, when I was thinking about this and God was walking me through um, this whole process, how do I wrap this up in a nice little pretty package that you can walk away understanding? It's this. You need to decide who you are. Are you an if God person? Or are you because of God person? Because a lot of us, we live in the if God. If God is real. If God hears my prayers, if God does this, then I'll do this. If we're in the if God place, we are like a wave tossed on the sea because you do not have a conviction yet of who he is. Richard had a conviction of who Christ was. And he was not an if God type of a person. He was a because of God type of person. Why? What does that mean for us? You've got to go do what God is asking you to do. And when you do it, you don't say if God is real, this is why I'm doing this. You say this, because of God, I'm going to go on this trip. Because of God, I'm going to do this ministry. Because of God, I'm going to, you fill in the blank. And we need to be the because of God people. Or because God people. Because when we say because of God, that's where our courage comes from. That's why we're allowed to be vulnerable. Why are we doing this church? Because God. Not if God. Trust me, if God, this church, it's way too much work. <laughs> like, let's just be real. I mean, we, I mean, as a staff and as a body of Christ, I mean, dealing with people is hard. It is very hard to deal with people. But because of God, we do it. Because of God, we become vulnerable. Because of God, we will listen and do what he asks us to do. Not if God, because God. And I want us to change our vocabulary. I want us to get this deep into our souls and into our hearts and into our minds. It's not if God, it's because God. If he's real, doesn't fly. Because he's real, this happens. This is who I am. This is why I do what I do. Do you see the pivot? See, a lot of us, we read the scriptures, we go to church, we do all these things. But, we still have that little if in there. Let's get rid of the if and do the become, or because. Now, I know a lot of you are sitting here and you're like, Craig, this is all well and fine. Where do you find that in the scripture? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, this is going to be, ooh, the, going to the... We're going to read a little bit. We're going to read 18 verses out of Philippians. And here's what I want us to listen to. I want you to hear the because God statements. Not if God, because God statements. Background. Philippi. It's just a really fun name to say, by the way. If you ever get a chance, just throw out a Philippi every once in a while, okay? It'll make you smile. It does. Just be like, Philippi. And it's like, oh, my mood's changed. I don't know why. Um, and you're thinking, now it's weird. But if, if you said Philippi right now, you're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of funny. All right. So listen. Philippi is, if you're going, if we're looking at a map, I don't have one, I did, but not anymore. But if you're looking at a map, last week we talked about Galatia, which is Turkey. You've got to keep going basically west, and you're going to end up closer to Italy. And basically, if you're going to look at where Philippi is, it's more towards Greece and in Greece, in that type of area. Is everybody following me on that one? I know there's no map to look at, but that's where you're at. You're kind of in, in the Greece area. Now, here's the thing. Paul is writing this letter to Philippi. He's writing this letter, and, one, and this, is one, this is known as one of the four letters 
that Paul wrote while he was in prison. Because even though he's in prison, that ain't stopping him from sharing the gospel and it's not shop, stopping him from encouraging and inspiring one another. Why? Because wherever Paul went, he created community. And guess what? If you ever read some of these letters, if you're not vulnerable, you're taking offense to a lot of these letters. And this is one of those letters that was written. So as we talked about Richard, a um, uh, 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 warm brand, and we talked about these people that were tortured for Christ, here's another person in the scriptures that was taken. He was tortured many, many, many times. And it never stopped him from preaching the gospel. And so now he's in, uh, he's in prison. Um, they're not sure exactly which prison he's in, but they know it's probably at the end of, uh, of the time where he went to Rome and he got in prison to get to Rome. But that's a whole thing we'll talk about later. And he's writing this letter to Philippi. And this is what it is. Chapter 2, this is what it reads. Remember, we're looking at those because God statements. And it goes on and says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any uh, participation uh, in the Spirit, any affliction and sympathy, or excuse me, affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and, one, and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Do you guys see community built into that? He's just saying, this is how you live. This is who you are. This is, if you are in Christ, this is just how you live. Verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who, through, uh, who, though, was in, uh, who was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What is that saying? Even though Jesus was God. He didn't sit back and be like, I'm God, worship me. And if you don't, I'll make you bow. Does that make sense? Like, I know that sounds weird because you know who Jesus is. He's loving and he's caring because he understands this whole concept of community. He understands the concept of love. He understands these things. But he was fully God. And as fully God, as fully God, he could have easily did whatever he wanted. But he didn't. He humbled himself, made himself vulnerable. Remember vulnerable or vulnerability, right? Physical and emotional, uh, uh, or opening yourself up to physical or emotional harm. You think Jesus fits that category of vulnerable? Even unto a cross. Verse 9, Therefore, God has highly, uh, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that every name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Verse 14, we're going to jump to verse 14. Do all things... Without grumbling or questioning. I'll say that one more time. <laughs> Verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God. Without blemish. In uh, the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast. Holding fast to the word of life, so that, in, that in, in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not uh, run in vain or labor in vain. 
even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen? Amen. What does all that mean? Be Christ-like. Not if God, but because of Him. I will do everything without grumbling, without questioning. I'm going to love. I'm going to live in unity. I'm going to be vulnerable with my community. Not because it's, it, it's, it's fun, but because I know that's how it makes me a righteous and holy person. Listen, I know we got some Catholics in here, so I'll share this. You know, confession... Everybody's like, why do we have to do confession? Well, it's because confession, when you go and do confession, what you're doing is you're speaking out loud the things that, that basically are unholy. And what happens is, is when you speak them out loud, that person, even though you can't see them, bears your burden with you. Does that make sense? This is why it tells us in the scripture, bear each other's burdens. Why? Because that's the only way we're going to make it through life. But I can't bear your burden if you're lying to me. I can't bear your burden if, you, if I look at you and I'm like, Hey, how you doing? And you're like, everything's peachy keen. Yay, Jesus! And inside, everything's dying. We have to be vulnerable. I know that opens a door. I know it does. Trust me. I'm in the same boat with you all. Like, let's be real. And I'm not sitting here talking about confessing your sins. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying being vulnerable. Somebody asks you how you're doing and you're not doing good, just be like, here, but here's why I'm not doing good. You know? People were asking me all morning, how you doing? Not good. The entire computer shut down. The one we just bought. I want to throw it through a window. I'm tired. My body hurts. But Jesus is good. <laughs> But we got to be vulnerable, right? We got to be able to share that with one another and, and not to just be complainers. No. Because you know what the hope is? That if I share that with you, you're going to put your arm around me. You're going to pray for me. You're going to encourage me. You're going to inspire me. And you're going to let me know that even at the end of the day, it's going to be okay. Why? Because God is here. So as we learn to pivot, where are you? If God, because God. Are you ready to be courageous and be vulnerable and take a stand in your community and take a stand for Christ? Because if Christ is your reality, nothing else matters. Let Christ be our reality. If we're going to look through anything, through any lens, let it be through His Scripture and through His Word. Let's have His reality. Amen? Amen. So Father God, as we get into worship right now, we would just want to glorify You and praise You because we already sang it though, Father, You deserve it all. And God, we are not um, blind to the fact of who You are. And it's not if you, Father, it's because of you we will stand and we will raise our hands. It's because of you we will declare the words that we are singing this morning. It's because of you, Father God, that we are going to listen to you and be one in spirit. It's because of you, Father God. So we will be courageous. If we are the only church that does it, church meaning community, then we will be a community, Father. And God, we want to be a community that is not a holy huddle. We're going to be a community that invites others to live in this courageous uh, world with us. To live in Christ, in the Spirit, with us. So Holy Spirit, we lay everything down to you this morning. And we praise you for who you truly are. In Jesus' name.
nothing else will do I just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want
you are, yeah. and that is who you are, even when, even when I don't feel that you're working, even when I don't see that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop, oh, even when I don't feel that you're working, even when promise keeper, a miracle worker. We know for a fact you are the light in the darkness. And there is nothing, Father God, that can stand in our way if you are for us. So God, we are tired of being if people. It's time, Father God, because of you to stand up and be who we are called to be. So God, I am asking you, make a way. If there's somebody in this place right now that needs a way make it father god or maybe you already have it so open our eyes to see it father god but god we know no matter what's going on you are by our side so father we praise you we love you we thank you we cannot wait to share with the world who you are father so lord be with us be with us remind us of these moments we love you and all that agreed said amen amen, amen.